Welcome to Unit 3, The Long Arc of History. Lesson 1 is about Gustave Le Bon, first of four men I call the godfathers of modern propaganda. While Le Bon's name is largely unrecognized today, I want to make sure that you know all about his influence. Why? I mean, who cares? This guy lived way back here, lived and wrote in the late 19th century. Why bother to consider his works? I want to learn about modern propaganda. The heck with the old stuff. Well, here's the deal. There are many subjects that one must learn sequentially. For example, if I dropped you into year four of med school, you have a heck of a time trying to make sense of the material. And if you w somehow wandered into hour three of a four hour movie, the same thing would happen. You'd have, you, you couldn't figure out the storyline. It would be hard to tell the good guys from the bad guys, right? You really have to watch it unfold from the beginning. Propaganda is like that. It's a story with a history and it should be analyzed over time to truly understand its development and its menace. And currently we have a lot of people living their lives who suddenly feel like things have gone a bit crazy in the world, but they don't generally follow politics, they're just minding their own business, and all of a sudden there's fake news, fact checkers, media lies being exposed, and people feel kind of overwhelmed. It's like being tossed out of a plane and parachuted into enemy territory from 10,000 feet. They feel lost and vulnerable. That's why examining the storyline over time, roughly the last hundred years, will dramatically improve your situational awareness and perspective. A mere definition of propaganda is utterly useless in comparison. So let's go back to Laban. Laban wrote a book in 1895 called The Crowd, A Study of the Popular Mind. This man was a broad thinker, total renaissance guy. He wrote over 20 books on a diverse range of topics, including a manual for the French cavalry, a book on physics, and another on anthropology. The Crowd, however, was his most popular and widely read book. Imagine, within one year, this book was published in 19 languages, and these arrows represent the 19 languages. That's a lot. Now, what it tells you is this was an idea whose time had come. The book took off like wildfire for good reason. Well, let's think back and see what was going on in the late 19th century, leading up to Laban's book. If you remember in 1859, Darwin published his book called The Origin of Species, which was all about the theory of evolution. And in 1884, Nietzsche declared God was dead. Now this is a big deal, right? If you think of society as having a foundation, and all the people standing on top of that foundation, then at this point in time, we're, we're starting to see major cracks in the belief structure that holds Judeo-Christian culture together, what we would call the West. The conviction that God created man and endowed him with purpose in the world is being challenged and repudiated. People can actually feel the turbulence of this time. And one of the things that Laban highlights is that events like the French Revolution do not simply happen in a vacuum. It's the accumulation of ideas that predate the revolution that gives rise to the event. And we'll see the same thing developing, uh, or the same thing in the development of propaganda. Ideas, he reminds us, are revolutionary, including the ideas in his book. Remember, in the late 1800s, the Industrial Revolution had caused massive dislocation of people from the towns to the cities. Working conditions were poor, and there was a significant backlash against big corporations. The crusading journalists called the muckrakers were digging up stories about the abuses of child labor and the horrible conditions in manufacturing. They were clamoring for new laws. They were syndicating, they were forming unions and starting to, to demand workers' rights. Laban understood that this period of transition was fraught with danger. He stated, the ideas of the past, although half destroyed, being still very powerful and the ideas which are to replace them being still in the process of formation, the modern age represents a period of transition and anarchy. If current rulers weren't careful, the divine right of kings was going to get replaced by the divine right of the masses. He lamented, crowds are somewhat like the sphinx of ancient fable. It is necessary to arrive at a solution to the problems offered by their psychology or to resign ourselves to being devoured by them. In other words, eat or be eaten. There are a lot more of the masses than the elite leaders. If they did not find a solution for how to control the drifting masses of people sitting on a fragile and cracked foundation, bad things were going to happen. The minds of people previously ruled by Judeo-Christian ideals needed a new master. 
who or what would now rule the angry masses? How is it possible to prevent uprisings and steer them toward the elite's own interests instead? So let's move on to Le Bon's answer for the control of masses. Now rule number one, never, never, never use facts and reasons. Use emotional appeals and nice sounding sentiments, storytelling and illusions if necessary. Number two, use images, words, formulas that contain powerful sentiments but have vague meaning. Rule number three, use experiences because they have a huge impact on what people believe. Remember the phrase, seeing is believing. That's really important. Rule number four, use trusted authorities to impress ideas on the masses. Hijack their authority and use it to compel your own ideas. Rule number five, once something reaches a critical mass, contagion or social pressure works to leverage the idea throughout the population. In no uncertain terms, Lebon suggested that the masses searching for direction in turbulent times could and should be steered by leaders who understood the crowd mentality and that would use it to their advantage. Do you see why I named Lebon one of the godfathers of propaganda? Modern democracy and the whole idea of the consent of the governed is upended by the ideals in this small book. Truth has been declared passe and the dialogue between rulers and the ruled a mere fiction. Leaders, if they were savvy and wise, should simply learn the rules of mass manipulation. This was revolutionary. Le Bon in 1895, right here, stands on the precipice of the 20th century and declares, all our ancient beliefs are tottering and disappearing while the old pillars of society are given way. One by one, and the power of the crowd is the only force that nothing menaces. The age we are about to enter, in truth, will be the era of crowds. So in other words, democracy, move over, crowd management is here. This material excited minds all over Europe and beyond, including people like Hitler, Mussolini, and of course Creel and Bernays in the United States. To those who understood the importance of Le Bon's work, the explosion of propaganda in World War I was perhaps not surprising at all. Le Bon's theories are the basis of the propaganda model we will be building on further in the course. So remember the five rules because you'll be seeing them again. All right, so in the next video, I'll introduce George Creel, the mastermind behind the first large-scale propaganda campaign in the United States on behalf of World War I. We'll see you then.